What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome in to another episode of the Triple Play Fantasy Baseball Show. A proud member of Underdog and the Underdog Fantasy family. And if you head over to Underdog Fantasy right now with Fantasy Baseball Drafts in full swing, use promo code TRIPLE. You'll get $100 deposit match up to $100. So they will basically double your first deposit up to $100 if you use that code. Again, right now, there are so many best ball drafts going at Underdog Fantasy with the season just weeks away. So if you want some free money to draft with, head on over to Underdog Fantasy today. We are back with you guys tonight. Our last starting pitcher preview, starting pitcher preview part three, as we are almost wrapped up with our position previews heading into the season. Again, it is just a few weeks away. We are excited and we are ready to give you guys a lot of great content coming this season. We are here with Doc, Will Cheesecake, and Marty Party. Me and Marty Party are fresh off of watching the Love is Blind reunion last night. So I, I can't think of a better transition than watching Love is Blind to pitching, Marty. I completely and absolutely agree. And shout out to all of our listeners who do watch Love is Blind. It's one of my favorite shows on TV at the moment. I feel like there's new episodes like every four, five, six months. Like they're cranking them out now. Uh, new it's seasons great. all the time. It is, it is great. Uh, a little cheesecake in the house tonight. He's just looking in awe and like, what are you guys talking about? Yeah, I don't watch Love is Blind. Is this um, is this love for a, a blind person? <laughs> or, you just, or you just don't see them before you fall in love without seeing them. Is that what you it fall is? In love without that's seeing that's them. what it is. Yeah. There's a wall in between them um, and they can't talk about their appearance, but honestly I could see Netflix in the future with everything they've been pulling a, a lot, like an actual love is blind and you know, having blind, you know, lovers meet each yeah. other. I could see yeah, that. absolutely. That'd be a good one. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a good concept for a show. Um, <laughs> I think that'd be pretty interesting. I would wonder what they'd talk about. Like what's on your side of the wall? Oh, what's on your side of the wall? <laughs> well, Marty, you forget that uh, this season someone said they look like Megan Fox. And they did say what they look like. And <laughs> This has got to be a couple show. It is. It is. I'm surprised yeah. that Madison hasn't made you watch it yet. You know, it's funny. Maybe not yet. Uh, but our buddy Nick, a.k.a. Nick's MLB Picks, said, I have to go. We were on the a call yesterday. He said, I have to go. My wife wants to watch Love is Blind. You guys should just you guys should just watch this season because do you want really to be good. a couple and watch it together? Yes, yes. You can be. You guys should, should just watch it and then come back with your review of it next week. All right, I'll give it a shot. And I, I do want to say for Nick's picks, I'm sorry about Noel de Marte. I know you're pushing him huge, and uh, yeah, you hate you hate to see it. 80 game suspension, PEDs. <sighs> He's suspended for 80 games. Dolan Cease traded to the Padres. Garrett Cole out for at least one to two months. A lot of news has happened since our last episode. Obviously, we'll kind of talk more about that stuff when we get in season. Uh, but tonight, it's all about just previewing what's ahead, and that's SP Preview Part 3. So we're kind of now pretty much looking. We're, we're past the studs. We're past even the kind of interesting arms in the middle of the draft. We're looking at guys now that you kind of go towards your end of your drafts. Pitchers going 75 or later. Uh, this is just a wide range of guys. So these guys are not going to cost you a lot of money to grab, but they could be game changers for your fantasy team. So we have some names we want to bring up tonight. Uh, there'll be a lot of names. So obviously you don't have to draft all of these guys, but if any of the guys give you good reasoning for and kind of tickles your fancy on somebody, that's the time to go grab them. So there's a lot of names in the queue here. I'm going to pull up the NFBC ADP over the last week, which is over that time, just about 62, 61 drafts over the last week on the NFBC. And Marty, I'm going to let you kick it off. Which player would you like to talk about first? Yeah, and um, I have some, some of those players are actually players I'm out of. Like I'm not, I don't want to draft at all. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll highlight those as well. But um, uh, let's start with, I'm going to start with Graham Ashcraft. And he's actually someone I do not want to draft. So but here's the most high. interesting, exactly, out of Louis Varlin, Reese Olsen, Dean Kremer, Sean Manaya, um, Zach Little, all of these guys, Graham Ashcraft still has the the low or the highest minimum pick. You know, his is 240, while the other guys are 242, 249, 250, 285. So there are people believing in Graham Ashcraft somewhere, but I'm not one of those people. Over the spring, nine innings pitched, nine hits, seven earned runs, only six strikeouts to his four walks, and with a seven ERA in that horrible place of a ballpark. Um, 
I don't, I don't, I have him in maybe in, in one, um, in uh, one 15 team league, just because he is going to pitch a lot. It was a big it was a 50, 50 rounder, but I, I don't see any reason. Does anybody else see a reason to why he has a min pick a two forty right now? Uh, that was probably a relative of his. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he was, he was very good down the stretch uh, last season, at, but he had, I mean, he he was very bad during the middle of the season, but he was like down the stretch over the second half. He was very good, but I don't think the skills really backed up the production that he was giving you. That was excellent. Um, I, yeah, there there is hope if you just believe that those those stats are what he's going to give you again. But I think the ballpark and the fact that he's not really like a top end actual pitcher really yeah. scared me. I think I think part of it is is just we're looking at his stuff number, you know, stuff plus number. I think that everyone's kind of in with what Eno's doing. Um, it, his stuff number is 109, so that's excellent. But the location is 99, so he leaves a lot of pitches over the uh, the heart of the plate, and you know you cannot do that in Cincinnati. I remember last year his ADP really started rocketing up because he had added velocity, and he had started showing that he had another gear in terms of strikeout stuff. And that was a problem for him because he was generating weak contact, but he didn't have any swing and miss in his game. And that was something that looked like it was starting to develop, which is why I remember last year people were in on him, including myself. Uh, but then as the season started going on, his velocity dipped back down to what he was throwing. And in turn, he got lit up, but that, you know, referenced by his ERA right there. Um, so, I, I mean, we talk about this with all Reds pitchers. The ballpark uh, is, is a huge thing. Uh, he hasn't had a decent track of success, right? Like last year he had some okay stretches, but still finished the year with a four, seven, two ERA still finished the year with 111 strikeouts and 145 innings. That's, I mean, there's nothing good in this profile to me that other than like the ground said, balls. I mean, that he has a good ground ball rate, but other than that, yeah, I don't, it's, um, and, and, and the, at the end of the draft, and this is just more of a philosophy thing. When you're back this far and you've seen so many good pitchers falling over these last few weeks to injuries, you're looking someone for either huge upside or someone who's not going to potentially destroy everything that you're building. I think Graham Ashcraft can destroy it. Well, the other guys we talk about, I think there'll be a, a good ceiling to them. I feel like there was optimism going into last year. He had a 402 expected ERA in 2022 and 0.94 home runs per nine. And if you look at his minor league numbers, it had never been above 0.5 home runs per nine at any stretch. So 2023, I mean, you can't back that at all. And and 2024 isn't looking good either. But I think I feel like people are chasing kind of his prospect pedigree leading up to this. Yeah, agreed. With Graham ass crack as right now, he is with him being hated on the show. He's either, you know, golden Graham if he's good or he's ass crack if he's bad right now. He's ass crack for us. <laughs> Let's go to the next player here. Oh, and this Graham is a cracker. But Golden Graham sounds better. Okay. Um, there's a name that both of you have on your list here. Reese Olsen. Doc, I want you to tee off on this one. And Marty, you can tag in here of your Detroit Tigers. I love talking about a guy that I like. And then uh, somebody of that fan of that team pitches in. So Reese Olsen was really great down the fantasy baseball playoffs. Over the last six starts... He had 37.2 innings, a 1.45 ERA. And if you look at the entirety for the season, 140 innings, I feel like at this point, you're not going to get a lot of guys that are guaranteed to throw that. And and I like the fact that barring anything crazy, he is going to be locked into the tires, the Tigers rotation. Um, it's interesting because when you look at the projection systems on fan graphs, Steamer has him at the most at 134. They range anywhere from 118 to 134, and he threw more innings last year. So I, I'm curious why that has it on there. Um, but 16.6K to walk percentage last year, 1.22 home runs per nine, but he's playing in a bad division. And overall, I mean, he had a 3.99 ERA, 1.22 whip. But I look at how he ended the season. Like I said, that 1.45 ERA over the last six starts, that included – six innings, one earned run against the Dodgers. Uh, I just like when people kind of end their season like that and, and carry it in. And um, look, he's nothing flashy. He's not going to have big swing and miss material. But, um, you know, once again, the pitchers we're talking about here, I think you, for me, 
I'm looking for guys that are guaranteed a spot in the rotation to begin the season and aren't going to kill you. Marty, the whole Detroit Tigers rotation is being hyped up. Um, you know, is it the pitching coaches? Is it just these guys have finally been able to tooled with the stuff that they need to take the next step? You know, Tariq Skubal in many rankings, including myself, he's a top 10 pitcher. Uh, you have Casey Mize on the men, Matt Manning, Reese Jack Olson. Flaherty's having a great spring Jack training. Flaherty looks really good. Like, what is it with these Detroit Tiger guys? I think a lot of me, myself included, I think a lot of fantasy uh, players just gave up on the Detroit Tigers rotation. And so now that they're seeing some improvement here earlier on in the spring, they look to their ADP and they see what is a free baseball player. So I think it's more of just their price and how basically free they are. But going back to Reese Olsen specifically, and he just uh, tossed uh, three scoreless innings on Tuesday against the Braves. So I was pretty excited about that. Um, strong 94 mile an hour fastball. His sinker is the 95 miles an hour as well. But he only has one pitch that is, you know, uh, considered above average. It's a slider. And I love the, the – it's a great ballpark. Uh, I think the team's up and coming. I think there's a possibility for him to get wins. I'm not sure – I'm about I'm about 95% sure he's going to be in the rotation. They're still iron, ironing that out. Matt Manning's really struggling right now. And we're seeing Jack Flaherty, Casey Mize, and Scoop all playing, you know, all pitching really well. So – I'm a little bit concerned about the, you know, that he's going to be a deadlock for the rotation, but at his price, you know, it's perfectly fine. And what the biggest question is, is can he tap into his strikeout ability that he had in double A? So at, mm -hmm. at Erie, at 119 innings pitched, he had 168 strikeouts. So his, his stuff plus number is 94, which is below average. So I, I'm interested to see over the, you know, if he does make the rotation, you know, Fingers crossed that he does. I'm going to be very interested to see what his stat cast stat is and see if he's able to tap into what he was able to do at double A. Now, Cheesecake, we've been talking about Detroit Tigers. I want you to jump in here as well. Yeah. You are really big on Jack Flaherty and potentially Matt Manning here as they seem yeah. like they kind of piqued your interest. Talk to us about them. Manning is is to me is a very interesting uh pitcher at this at this uh part point in the draft because he, he doesn't strike people. I had like a 16% strikeout rate last year. His strikeout minus walk, though, was like 11 or 12, which is excellent. But with that strikeout rate, it's really hard to roster him. However, I did roster him last season for a lot of spot starts, and uh, I, I found him very useful. So I went to look back and to see if my memory of how I used him last season fit with the statistical profile. And if you look at Manning last season, he had 15 starts. Nine of those, he went over five innings and gave up under two earned runs. So he was basically 60% of the time giving you really strong starts. The ones where his worst starts also, and now look at this, it, it almost becomes like, like the guy that you can actually pick and choose type of thing last season he was at Colorado, at Toronto, against the Tampa Bay Rays in August. Um, the, against the Angels and at Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is the only one you might have eaten out of those. You're probably not starting them at Colorado or at Toronto. It, 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 in, and so, like, I thought Manning was a very interesting draft pick at that. Like, like a, a good pitcher, like a like a like a guy he's going around like a Kyle Hendricks type, a guy who's not going to strike out a lot, but he's going to be effective when he pitches. Uh, so I think he's a strong draft pick at that point especially in like one of these like dc ones where you need to get a lot of pitchers and you want to make get guys are going to give you innings flaherty to me i i mean i'm as we were talking about like his spring training he's looked good mm -hmm. i i found last season to be very disappointing for flaherty and i didn't know if i was going to be in on this this price but i think his spring has given me some hope that he could be you know um that he could be a useful pitcher in in on on a on a pitching staff, but I I don't think that we're going to get back to what he was in his heyday. But um, hopefully the health comes through. He pitched uh, about a, like almost a full season last year. If he pitches a full season this year, I, you know I, I have some hopes that uh, Detroit will be a good division and a good park to pitch in for him. I, was his velocity up? I remember he had uh, he put it, he had four scoreless with five strikeouts in his last start. 
Yeah, his velocity was up. He got up to a 96 mile an hour fastball, and then he went back with an 88 mile an hour slider at one point. It was actually pretty nasty. Uh, as you guys know, I'm, I'm notoriously do not like Jack Flaherty, but uh, mm. I like what I'm. I, I now like what I'm saying. Is it because he's that handsome? <laughs> no, I just think he's kind of a d bag. A little a bit. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I remember that when he was with the Cardinals, just hearing stories about him. So I, I can get that there. What? And, but and apparently not. he's the one that uh, said that he started the whole Contreras catching thing. He said, he, you know, they weren't, he wasn't a good fit as their catcher. Apparently it started with him. I don't know. I'm not I'll, I'll say this. Flaherty threw 144 innings last year. The previous three seasons, 154 combined. So, mm-hmm. you know, for somebody that's had shoulder issues, maybe he just needed to throw less innings. I, I know obviously he had a five ERA last year and he's, he's looked good this spring, but he might not be that injury prone guy that we've labeled him for years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, his command is the thing I've been the most impressed with. I mean, he's notoriously walking people left and right. So he's been able to stay outside of the, the middle of the plate and work on the corners, uh, which is, it's worked out really well for him. David, do you remember when we bet on him to not get the win last year and he <laughs> walked like eight guys, but didn't I remember that. Hit? I remember they weren't they up like 10 0 and we were just like you just have to pitch five innings. Like it doesn't matter. You're not gonna give up enough runs to lose we, the game. We bet yeah. on Jack Flaherty to not get a not get a win and he didn't give up a hit, but he gave up like eight walks and threw a hundred pitches and uh left with five innings, no earned runs, uh, escaped with like bases loaded three times. It was nuts. It was absolutely nuts. Um there's another player we've been talking a lot about Detroit Tigers, but there is a player on this list that Art has that I want to talk about that neither of you put on there, but I'm sure you're familiar with what's going on. And that's Ryan Weathers, who I believe as of this recording, or at least it was a couple of days ago, he was leading spring training in strikeouts and looks like a totally different pitcher for the Marlins, who if he continues to pitch like he has, is going to have a rotation spot. And he was actually going to be one of the players I was going to take in TGFBI when, unfortunately, we already went through pre-show what happened in, in TGFBI right now. Yes, we are still drafting. Uh, Art, Ryan Weathers, should we be intrigued? Yep, yep. The velo's up. Uh, his his, his slider is actually breaking more than it than it had been. Um, I like I like him. I think he's got a really good chance. They, they just put Max Meyer down in AAA camp. They've had a... Um, They've had a few, you know, injuries. I think there's a really Yuri good shot. Yuri Perez had a blister resurface. Yeah, I think there's a really good shot. He's in the rotation, and you know, he's always had a lot of talent. Even in San Diego, he he showed flashes of being a, an effective starter. Um, the fact that his pitchers are performing a little better and the velo's up, I think um, he could be a, a nice little late round uh, addition to your squad who could produce a surprise season. I, I like him this year. I like the way Mar- uh, the Marlins use their pitchers as well. Yeah, and you know they don't talk. We don't talk about them like the Dodgers or the Guardians or some of the other teams that develop pitching, but they've been pretty good over the years. And uh, Ryan Weathers has definitely now become an intriguing target uh, with the increased strikeout stuff. And I think even in a worst case scenario where maybe he comes out of the bullpen, but he gives you three innings, faces the lineup once, uh, that can be valuable, especially in a points league format as a relief pitcher eligible. And uh, like. There. He's 24. Like it feels mm-hmm. like he's been around a long time. He's only 24 years old now. Like he's, uh, I, and so like he's it, on the aging curve. He still has potential for growth. I yeah. I actually was just looking that up. I, I was surprised to see he was still only 24. Now Marty, you have a player on this list that burned me last year in a big way uh, because I basically put myself out there in the world talking about him. Oh yes, and. Uh, do you think maybe he bounces back this year with the New York Mets and Sean Mania? Yeah, I think we're. Um, I, I'm not going to say I like really do think he uh, he bounces back, but I really like where he's going. Um, here's what he's done over in spring training so far: six point two innings, nine hits, three earned, eight K, so eight strikeouts in six point two innings, uh, three walks with a uh, equals to a four point zero five ERA and a one point eight zero WHIP. So everything's high there. But his, his location's always been really good. He's always been able to aim his pitches. I really like the fact that he's going to be um, – is it City Field? Where the, is that New York Mets yeah, Field? Yeah, it's, it's still City Field. 
Yeah, City Field. I, it's hard to keep up with all the different names. Um, but yeah, so City Field's obviously one of the best pitchers park there is. Um, it's been that way for years. So for a guy who's had good strikeout numbers before, who has now found himself has found himself in a spot where he's going to have unlimited amount of pitching. I mean, they the Mets have nobody, so he's going to pitch as much as possible. I think he could, if he's your last pitcher that you draft. You know, I think it's going to be. I would, you know, see see what's going on with it. I don't know if I would start him right off, right out of the the gate, but um, at this point, it's not a bad investment. No, so I mean, do you go ahead, Doc. I know you're tying this well, into your bet here. Well, no, I was going to ask that as a follow up. Do you think the seam shift and wake approach is what messed him up? <laughs> Can you shut up <laughs> for him? <laughs> for him. <laughs> For for Manai, it's always going to be his health, man. That's just you don't know if he's going to stay healthy. He's he's always you know. Up I feel and like down. he's I feel like he's notoriously healthy though. I feel like he's just somebody that when he gets hit, he gets hit hard. Threw 117 innings last year, only started 10 games. 158 the year before that. 179 the year before that. 2018, yeah. 160 innings. Um, his strikeout prop for the season on one of the books is 146 and a half. Where do you go on that? What did he have last year? He had. I have it up so in front of me. He had 128 in, last year in in 117 innings. The Mets need him to pitch because Sanga do. went down. Severino is, I think, their ace going into the year. Technically, um, they have Jose Quintana. Isn't yeah. Jose Quintana the? He was named opening day starter. Oh, he was. So they. Oh, Quintana's the opening day starter. Yeah. Uh, you have oh, McGill rough. and Peterson, I guess, there too. But like Hauser, yeah, Hauser. Like they they have a bunch of guys that. And Tyler track McGill aren't. We'll get to Tyler McGill, but he's been absolutely incredible this spring. So we have to talk about him. Well, he was going to be my next transition since yeah. we talk about Mets pitchers. Is there anything else we want? I, I I still think I'm taking the over on it because I think he'll as long as he's healthy, he'll pitch it the innings to get over that. I, yeah, I, I, oh, I I I I wanted to point out that I. I think the Mets offense is going to be really good this year. Um, so there's a good chance that, you know, their pitching is going to be why they stink, but the offense might carry these guys when they pitch well to good to wins. And Manai wasn't actually as bad in the second half, 224 batting average against 3.43 ERA in 60 innings. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's exactly what I was going to say. I think I, we we expect him to be worse, but overall, he had a four point two one X ERA with a twenty five point seven K percentage. I, I feel like the Giants never gave him a fair shot. They were pretty adamant right away that he wasn't going to start and was only going to be a bullpen he had, piggyback guy. He had a few really bad starts, and I think that's what kind of did it in for him. He's only he thirty two years old. He feels like he's older. Yeah, he was really upset about that too with the Giants and the way they handled him. I like he said only 32 doc make it seem very young. Um, he stay just with feels the Mets. like he's older. Stay with the Mets, Marty. You, you touched on a Tyler McGill whose ADP is fastly rising right now. With he's been one of the spring training standouts. Um, yeah, and he did this a couple of years ago. I was saying uh, we've done this before. He've done it. He did uh, it last year. Yeah. So uh-huh. the question is, what's different now? Because we've we've ran this train once. Are we going to run this train again? I think what's always going to come down. So let's let's look at a sprint. Let's give him some flowers before I, I kind of tear him up. Uh, 12 innings pitch, two earn runs, 15 strikeouts, and only two walks. That's good for a 0.75 whip. Batters are batting 171 against him. He has electric stuff, and he's able to do this for two, three weeks at a time, but he's never been able to sustain it for a full season. So I think we're – I think people are now drafting him, expecting that he's going to be, you know, their fourth, fifth starter for the entire year. Where I'm thinking in my head, I think he's a good guy to have for the first month or so, and then cut when everything starts to get really bad for him. Uh, yeah, because if I remember, wasn't it because his velocity started going down, and then he became very hittable? Yeah, and there's it, injuries played into that too on, on a different couple of years. So it's 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 a mix of that, as it always is with pitching. That this is what we're seeing. It's such a it's so volatile um, mm-hmm. because the injury rate is so high. But I I think we're getting to be we're going to get into the territory where uh, Tyler McGill's overdraft. Well, oh, yeah. I feel like one of his issues has always been home road splits. I looked back at 2022, a home ERA of 4.37 and a away ERA of 5.84. Last year, a home ERA of 3.19 in 73 innings. 
City away Fielding. ERA of 6.79 in 53 innings. It, I, yeah. I know I know New York isn't a place like Coors, but those numbers are drastically different. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'll see this year. I think people that were snake bitten last year uh, are definitely going to be a little hesitant with him this year. But again, right now, his ADP, even with the rise over the last week, uh, it's still at a very reasonable price of pick under 500, 499. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's still and I would rather where he's take a going shot right on. now. He's still in that that spot where you can have him for a month or two because we have to remember he had a five point eight five X ERA last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, Doc, a pick player that's going just before him is someone that you said you have notes on. So I'm guessing you dove into him very in depth. AJ Smith Shaver of the Atlanta Braves, who I believe was just sent down to AAA. Yeah, well, uh, you know, some people have said you look like A.J. Smith. I knew that was coming, but there's no picture on screen. Of course. So, I mean, when you look at last year, 25 innings in the MLB, 3.87 expected ERA. And I'm looking at, is he going to be in spring training the entire, or AAA the entire year? I don't intend on Max Freed, Chris Sale, or Charlie Morton staying healthy the entire year. So, you know, just like a couple of years ago when you talked about Christian Javier not having a spot in the rotation, you know, sometimes you go with the talent and then the opportunity arises. Uh, but spring training, a 28.9K percentage. And the last down, he had 5Ks and 2.2 innings against Minnesota against most of their starters. And when I look at his 2023 batting average against three of his pitcher or three of his pitches did very well. Fastball, uh, 196 batting average against the slider, 133 batting average against but the curveballs would kill them a 364 batting average. So if he can improve that third pitch, I, I think that will, that will help improve uh, just overall. Cause I mean, if you, if you don't have a third pitch, I think that's sometimes what can kill you going that second, third time around the order. But um, I think the ADP is going to drop because he's beginning the year in AAA, And that's somebody that you could get at more of a discount. Or did you just put porn in the chat? What did you send us? That's a picture of AJ Smith Shaver. I wanted to see if he actually did look like you. I think he actually um, looks at, looks more like Eric. <laughs> really? <laughs> I do. Are we gonna pull it up? It's like uh, I mean, I can if you want. Here's the here's the tab. It looks like a mix of me and David. Yeah, we and you had a baby. That's what they look like. <laughs> <laughs> it's the youthfulness. The it, it, it's it's the youthfulness in the eyes that 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 Eric has still, and he's got a, my not, facial not a David hair. The father, he's lost it. <laughs> he's got my facial hair since David shaves. Uh, yeah. but he has like David's face, like the friendliness of David's face. It's very inviting. The friendliness of my face. I don't think I've ever heard that comment. Yeah, you just have like a very like calm, inviting face, a very chill demeanor. This makes very... him an excellent, excellent con man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I picked the wrong career. Sounds like I could have gotten away with anything. So, Do you think so? Yeah, you could have gotten away with being uh, an MLB pitcher. Oh, if only, man. I actually with softball, it's funny, like. We've literally been, this is the fourth day. I've been throwing every day. My arm feels like it's about to fall off. And I just, it's just crazy because you don't throw for so long. And then you start trying to throw like my elbow hurts, my shoulder hurts. And you're like, man, I can't be that old. But then it's like, I'm 32. It's like, imagine like Max Scherzer trying to throw. I'm like, how can you even do that? It's crazy. Justin Verlander. Or like Justin Verl. I'm like, and I know they've been throwing for a long time, but I'm like, man, like after like 20, 30 throws, I'm like, Gotta, what what Aaron so Savale told us when he was on the pod a couple of years ago, where if you make 30 starts, you feel a hundred percent for three of them at most that hit me. I mean, just, just go outside. I mean, I granted it's a softball, so it's a little bit bigger, but go outside and throw a hundred balls. Like just, you don't have to throw it as hard as you can, but just literally just like throw a ball a hundred times, like a baseball or softball and then see how that feels. Like it's actually crazy. Just like you really feel the fatigue and then have a pitch clock. There's so many factors. It's, I mean, that's why injuries are as high in pitchers as they are. Uh, It's, it's really something Uh, not to mention, I've been hitting ground. I hit a bunch of ground balls today and like now my, uh, my wrist hurts too. (laughs) 
<laughs> David <laughs> makes this show just as a soapbox to complain about how his body's breaking down. It really is. It's so early on, too. It's crazy. It's spring uh, training for you guys, David. I know, I know. But again, like I haven't hit I haven't hit in years. You're so it's using like hitting... muscles you haven't used. Yeah. Exactly. It's By the like end hitting... of the season, you'll be fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Like, yeah, I'm it's, slamming your unders. It's swinging a, <laughs> swinging a bat for the first time. <laughs> yeah, you should. You should hit slam my unders. Uh, a player that Eric's going to slam his unders on this year, probably going to be Lance Lynn, as Eric is out on Lance Lynn. Lancey Poo Lynn, as Eric calls him. Why don't you get your notes out on why you're going to uh, fade Lance Lynn this year? Well, I'm actually going to give him one more shot. Um, wow. When you say Lancey Poo Lynn, you know that gives off the impression you're down on him, right? I mean, it maybe, maybe. Um, look, I, I look last year. I mean, he's an innings eater, 184. And I know that doesn't necessarily mean everything, but 191 strikeouts. Um, I know the ERA was bad. It was a 5.73, but the expected ERA 4.86. So almost a full run lower. Uh, I, I think there's two main things that we have to look at. One, the walk percentage was 8.3%. That was the highest since 2018, but he was in the 98th percentile in 2022. So I, I see a big change in that year over year. Um, but he's had a 20% or above K minus walk percentage the last three full seasons. The other big thing is the 2.16 home runs per nine. Uh, he has to cut that down. I think it's just leaving pitches over the plate. I know he has some velocity that's dropped. Um, but I think it just being a little bit more crafty with pitches, I like the division he's in better. Um, the only thing I could look at is at baseball Savannah and say that there's some semblance of hope is a 69% whiff percentage. And I kind of wanted to just say that because of the number that it was. But, you know, when we talked about Chris Bryan a couple weeks ago and, and Art said, look, like, I can't give you any analysis. I just don't think he's done yet at 32 years old. That's what I'm saying at Lance Lynn. You know, we're talking about Scherzer and Verlander who are 38 and 40. I'm mm -hmm. hoping maybe he has one more good year at, at 36. And maybe he doesn't give you 180, but he gives you 130, 140 better innings last year. You know, maybe a 4-3, 4-4 ERA. I mean, or does it worry you that he was with arguably the best team he could possibly be with with the Dodgers in terms of last year their defense was solid, obviously the run support. And he still was very unreliable. I don't think getting traded midseason helps. It doesn't, but he's now in the NL Central with the Cardinals. He's with the Cardinals. Yes, he's with the Cardinals, who were dumpster fire last year. It's a better ballpark, I don't think... especially when it comes to home runs, which is his biggest problem. So more more people strike out um, in at Bush Stadium, and less people hit home runs. So that's good, but. And you know I love Lance Lynn, but that's about all I got. He's got to get in shape, man. He's just terribly out of shape, and he yeah. cannot mm -hmm. make it through. And if you watch the starts, because I do, because I'm a fanboy, he burns so many pitches. I would actually like to look to see. Um, I'm sure someone has it, but how many pitches he throws per inning? You know that average is absolutely through the roof. It's like almost every count's three two, and he just burns himself out. And, and what I'd be interested to see is his second year adapting to the pitch clock. You know, we saw it with, with Burley guys like him and Manoa last year that struggled. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously Manoa, who knows if we'll ever see him at that level again. He's already hurt now. Um, but, right. uh, but I'd like to see how Lancelin adapts the second year. Yeah, we will definitely see with that. LC, you had a, a big list of guys you sent prior to the show. I know there were a few that you felt very strong about, so I want you to pick someone on that list and then who to transition to the next guy here. Um, I can can I can I do a, a talk about the the back end of the Dodgers rotation real quick? Yeah, yeah, feel free. Yeah. All right, so one thing I want to bring up is a guy who very late in drafts I want to I like as like a rotation depth piece on on draft on the uh draft championship teams and is ryan yarbrough um who will pitch two three and four inning stints in the dodgers possibly as a piggyback role uh yarbrough had a 23 percent k rate after coming over to the dodgers and a three percent walk rate and those two three and four inning splits uh he's just the type of pitcher that um that Yarbrough, uh, that that the Dodgers often turn into like statistical uh, um, overperformers. So I think Yarbrough 
given the fact that he is going to be pitching in two, three, and four inning rolls, often as a piggyback, could pick up a lot of wins. And for some some reason, I don't know what the Dodgers did. Uh, his strikeout rate just jumped as soon as he got there. So um, I, I think that there's a good chance that Yarbrough has another strong season, and I and I want him on my roster now. I would like to open it up for everybody on Michael Grove versus Gavin Stone mm. as far as in the Dodgers rotation as the fifth starter with Emmett Sheehan out. Uh, I know Dave Roberts has said that it's still up in the air. Gavin Stone is getting picked way ahead of Michael Grove, but they're both having really good springs. Mm -hmm. Do we think they're both going to be getting starts or do you think that the common knowledge of Gavin Stone being ahead of Grove is how it's going to wind up and you're not kidding the adp gap between them 397 compared to 706 so yeah. it's a huge, huge gap um, yeah grove's an afterthought right now so definitely pick him up at the end of your drafts because i think he's going to be getting starts um go ahead. i'd be wondering if they do a six-man rotation to stretch out i don't think they do my personal Yamamoto. thoughts Roster Resource has them as a five-man rotation right now. Look at it as, as it currently is constructed. You have Tyler Glass now as your ace. You have Yamamoto as your number two. You have James Paxton. I believe he's either the three or the four. Um, you also have, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Bobby uh, Miller. Bobby Miller, thank Bobby you. Bobby Miller. Miller, I think he's the three. Paxton's the four. And then you have the... Gavit, the Gavin Stone or Michael Grove is your five. Like, what depth can you pull from? You have Walker Bueller not starting the year. You right. have you have Clayton Kershaw not starting the year. Right. Uh, they already traded away Ryan Pepio, so he's not an option anymore. Emmett Sheehan's hurt. Like, they don't have the arms to go six man right now. They're going to be seeing. You're, we probably will see some bullpen days where Yarbrough does bulk bulk. Maybe once a week they do something like that. I, I, and maybe uh, Grove gets some of that love too. Those that bulk relief outings mm -hmm. and gets to gets to vulture some wins that way as well. I, I think that Yarbrough and Grove, even if they don't make the rotation, will be valuable late in draft pieces. But I think they are will probably both get starts as well. Yeah, and to I Ryan. Oh. We were all all had a good thought. Uh, go ahead, Marty. Uh, just about Ryan Yarbrough, uh, to, to both your points, actually, um, James Paxton's the only lefty, you know, at the top of that rotation. And how long is James Paxton going to, you know, until he gets hurt? So we could see That's Ryan Yarbrough yeah. sliding in to a uh, starting pitching, a uh, starting pitcher pretty soon there. I think yeah. one of the things I wouldn't be surprised if the Dodgers made a move for like an Aaron Ashby guy, like a, a not even he necessarily. <laughs> But but not even necessarily him, but like the the Yarbrough types that throw three or four innings, I could see them doing that closer to the trade deadline. I mean, they just have. I mean, Glass now is not a glowing bill of health. James Paxton is not a glowing bill of health. Kershaw and Bueller obviously aren't either. Uh, there's just so many question marks in this rotation. That that's the big thing with me. So when I have these arguments with people about why I have Yamamoto at five and they're like, are, isn't he only going to throw like 120 or 130 innings? I said, you know, all, all the projection systems have him between like 160 and 180 uh, for that reason is I just, they don't, I don't think they have the arms with all these injury histories for their guys that they're going to be able to, to have him pitch every sixth day. Um, but I like what you're saying with Yarbrough, LC and, and Marty, because yeah, he probably will be the first guy to come in and be a bulk reliever on a bullpen day for these guys and pick up some wins for you and have good ratios. Um, probably again, finish maybe with like a, a, a four ish ERA, but he could pick up eight, nine wins. So that would be something that's realistic. And, I, and this isn't a challenge to you, David, but for Yamamoto for the first month or two, pay attention to how well he does the third time around mm -hmm. in the batting order. It could be, he could be great. I honestly don't know that, but that's the one thing I'm going to be watching the most. If we see him consistently go into that sixth inning, you know, seventh inning, um, I don't think he'll go too far too far past that. But if he can get through the you know the order for that third time, I think 180 is possible. That I think that's what's going to hold him back. If it's not a six man rotation, it's going to be can he be durable enough to go six seven every five days? 
Yeah, I, I think right now I was I, I had a talk with this uh, on the podcast we just recorded, and the things that I'm reason I'm not concerned yet with him because he's been kind of shaky so far his last couple outings. His control has still been good. He still, even though he gave up a few runs his last outing, he still had seven strikeouts in four innings. So the strikeout stuff is still there, and the velocity is still there. A lot of times you're seeing people in spring training. Uh, you look for those type of things rather than the results directly. And one of the things I know that I had heard was that players said we basically can't touch his other stuff, so we're just sitting on his fastball. That's the one pitch we're looking for is his fastball. It's the only pitch we can really pick up on right now just seeing him. Uh, so I think it's one of those things that he can correct. I'm not saying his, you know, obviously you don't want a hittable fastball, um, but I, I think it's very easy for him to correct that. And that's something that why I still very much believe in him because I think the more he mixes in his other pitches – um, and keeps the hitters off balance from his fastball. I think that will be a, a big deal for him. Um, back to your original thought, though, LC. I, I'm very much in on Gavin Stone, even though the ADP is obviously a lot higher, because it was said that it, uh, pretty documented that he was tipping his pitches as well. Um, that that was the the big reason why he struggled as much as he did last year, and it showed because he finished the year, I believe, uh, decently strong once they figured that out. So I think that is a very tangible thing that they fix for him. And I think that that is a reason, again, why the ADP gap is so massive. Mm -hmm. And he could be, uh, you know, as right under pick 400 for the Dodgers rotation. It's a very good value. Um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> I just saw a comment that Dave's going to be on the IR next week. Yeah, yeah, That's I had that up for like five minutes while you're looking at your phone. I'm looking at my phone because I can't pull up roster resource on my computer anymore. It blocks the site. What? I'm on my work computer. That's the only computer I have. And fan graphs is blocked at work. Yeah, they blocked fan graphs. They haven't blocked baseball savant yet, but they actively add more sites that they block. So I can't. It's, You're going to be the reason why. It's so, it's so annoying. But yeah, so that's why, why you see me half the time because I have to look up that on my phone. Um, all right. Next player we're going to talk about is we just did a couple of guys in the Dodgers rotation. We talked about some Tigers. Uh, Marty, let's go back to you. I, we need some Twins love on this show. Louis Varland, a, a Twins pitcher from your one of the rival teams here. Looks like he's going to get a shot to make the team out of spring training. I I like Louis Varland. He, I wouldn't say he's my favorite pitcher in the rotation, and I, I think that his ceiling is potentially capped. I don't know in terms of becoming a frontline starter, if that's there for him, but it could be a useful piece this year. Yeah. I mean, I, well, first off, I was able to get him free in my gladiator drafts. I have him on two gladiator teams where he's my last pitcher. So I'm with this improved velocity. Um, everything that I've seen this spring has been incredible. 11 innings pitched six hits, zero earned runs over those 11 innings, 11 Ks, mm -hmm. one walk, 0 0.64 whip. Uh, he's going to be in the rotation. We don't have to worry about that. I, I'm not, I don't think, I don't think Anthony Discofani is going to get it over. You know, he's going to be the fifth starter over him. I don't care. We don't utter that name on this podcast. What about Tony Disco? Can I say that? Eric, Eric lost like 300 on him. I wish I lost only 300. Oh, that's right. I forgot it was more. <laughs> I didn't mean to bring that up, but I got, um, yeah, at Disco's uh, on the shelf with elbow soreness right now. So. Okay. So yeah, he, can't, he can't hurt me anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so that would be the only thing, if, you know, maybe they move him to the bullpen at some point, or um, I don't think they'll send him down the triple A. I don't think they're able to do that, but uh, he was really good. He was a great reliever last year, 1.5 ERA in 12 innings with 17 strikeouts and only one walk. His fastball hits triple digits. It's going to be, can he go four, five, six innings? That's going to be the biggest question if he's a starter. As well, We're seeing a lot of that too, especially guys with this high of velocity. But Louis Varlin, I don't think there's anyone more exciting um, in the range that he's going. Yeah. Anytime you're getting a uh, one that's going to contribute in the rotation, has some prospect pedigree, uh, the Twins need pitching. Obviously, the losing Kenna Maeda and losing Sonny Gray, there's two open spots in that rotation. So um, as long as he can be a somewhat efficient, then um, that's you know definitely going to be a good pick there with Louis Varlin. Let me get um, Ryan you're off the screen. Here. Anthony Desclafani, sorry, just want to point out that he did throw today. His next step is going to be a minor league game start, but that has not been decided on when that's going to be. 
per uh, manager Rocco Baldelli. So that Scalfani still should be considered on the shelf until he gets that minor league game start. And then next step after that, start a game that you're only supposed to pitch one inning and screw someone out of a lot of money. Yep. <laughs> Doc, stay with you for a second. D, uh, we got Dean Cosmo Kramer, who pitches okay. for your Baltimore. I, 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 I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. Pitches for your Baltimore Orioles there. Marty likes him as well, or he at least has him on his list. So, obviously, we like the Orioles. They have a great young uh, offense. Pitching is going to be headed by Corbin Burns this year, but this is kind of the forgotten fifth guy in the rotation right now. Dean Kramer, someone that could be a sneaky pick for you right now, going ADP of two or 330. Yeah, to me, that's way too low. So I look at last in, last year, 173 innings. I mean, I, what type of volume are you going to get from guys that you're drafting in that area? And when you look, Kyle Bradish is out. They haven't established a timeline for when he's going to return, but I imagine they don't rush him. Uh, John Means is going to be out, and Corbin Burns in. And I like the fact that they're getting a true ace. I think it takes less pressure off the rest of the staff. I think it takes pressure off Grayson being the number two. And uh, I think having a veteran like that, you can always learn some stuff from. And I wonder how much Dean Kramer's last start with the uh, against the Rangers in the playoffs plays into effect, obviously the stuff that was going on with Israel um, and his mm -hmm. family. But I look at the first and second half of Dean Kramer. First half, a 280 average, 478 ERA, 92 Ks to 25 walks and 98 innings, an OBP of 330. But the second half, a 218 batting average, a 325 ERA, 65 Ks. He actually walked more, 30 walks and 74.2 innings, a 293 OBP. The difference was he allowed 20 home runs in the first half, seven in the second, a 481 slug in the first half, 327 in the second. So I think if he can just keep the ball in the ballpark that we're going to see a lot more of the second half Dean Kramer, uh, I think he's in a better position to get wins. He went at least five, in, uh, five innings and 24 out of the 32 starts. So I just like what you're going to get from him at this point. And I think that's the last one of the last guys in that range that can give you 150 innings. Marty, do you, like, do like, do you like Tyler Wells? That's all I want to know. I like. I my, do. I'm intrigued by Tyler Wells. I, I do like Tyler Wells. He was leading the American League in the first half of the season for WHIP, but he was once again he was somebody that was giving up a lot of home runs, and the O's sent him to AAA. So I, I feel like they're more committed to Kramer than they are to Wells. I mean, they're probably going to have to start Wells in the rotation, mm -hmm. um, and because of um, because of the injury to. Um, who is it? I can't remember now. But, means oh, Bradish. Means and Bradish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Wells is going to have to be in the rotation. I just when they shut him down with the statistical season he had been putting together, which was still very solid. I was really worried. So I'm wondering if we can project him to get that full season of innings. Uh, like like Kramer, like 173. They, he's fine for next season. Like you don't have to worry about any any sort of. Um, any sort of restraint on his, his, his volume. I think Wells, I like the fact that he was a 0.99 whip for a lot of the last season and a low three ZRA, but can we project more than like 115, 120 innings from him? So um, I was wondering what, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure. Do you guys think, would you guys project more than 120 for Tyler Wells? Probably not. I'm not. And, and I mean, Art last year, and and keep in mind, you know, I, I go to games and I've seen him pitch and all that. It, he's somebody that you, when you watch in person, you think he gets lucky, and then when you actually look, the BABIP, he had a 200 BABIP, 246 the year before, 226 the year before that. The expected ERA last year was 4.04 and 1.9 home runs per nine. Like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind taking a flyer on him. But I'm feeling much better about Kramer, and it's not close. Yeah, I prefer Kramer. Uh, he has two above average pitches. Um, he's in a good ballpark. You know, he. I I, I know Wells is in the same thing, but um, with Kramer, I I think there's more of a ceiling there. But Wells, I, I hear what you're saying, Art. I mean, his the XBA against him was 217 last year. He strikes out guys 25 percent of the time, and a 3.96 xERA, like anything under four. At this point of the draft, I mean, I would get both of them. 
If you get Kramer and Wells, I mean, I think if those are your last two pitchers in a 15 team league, I think yeah. that's pretty solid. Like a, a fab league where you can get Wells until he's no longer in the rotation anymore. When Bradish gets back, you just drop him at that point. I think it's a solid move, especially because, yeah, they're not going to want him in full season in the rotation, but he's going to start there. So maybe I, that's, I'm, yeah. I, I'm kind of curious and I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery haven't signed yet. What pitchers do you think are going to be the biggest names on the trade market prior to the deadline? I think of pitchers that are on bad teams that might be selling. Um, I mean, Dylan Cease was obviously the face of that until this trade. Yeah. Um, I could see Shane Bieber if, if he bounces back and the Guardians are kind of like middling. He could be one of them. I could see the New York Yankees being forced to maybe trade for Bieber at some point. Mm -hmm. I got if, if Bieber is somewhat decent this year, he'll get moved. Like a, a Patrick Sandoval, if the Angels decide that they're not going anywhere this I mean, year, he would, he's been one in innings here. No, they yeah, but the Angels like with I I was looking at the Angels like Canning perhaps maybe De if Detmers is solid, but they're not they're not big end. I, I mean Canning, I like him a lot, but like I don't think he's a a big mover. I don't think that's a that's huge what I'm, I I was thinking about it recently that between the injuries and kind of the stalemate with signings, um, I feel like there are less pitchers that are on the open market. And obviously, we haven't even had the season start, but it seems like teams that are committed this year are either going to add someone or the teams that um, you know aren't really anywhere in contention. The Athletics, the Angels, the Rockies don't really have arms to trade. I got a potential trade, Freddie Peralta. Why don't the Brewers trade him too? I could see that. Um, how many years of arbitration does he have left? Let's see. That's he'd be a really good candidate, Art. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he is. He's on a at the end of a five year contract this year. Do you think a team would pay? Do you year. think a team would trade for Patrick Corbin? And I'm saying this seriously. With one year left. Uh, a lefty that's durable, uh, that maybe a new change to scenery will recreate his magical slider. No, I mean for what? Like he's he's making like twenty million dollars too. Yeah, but next year is the last year of his uh, atrocious contract. I I don't know. There's not like the salary cap where in like the NBA where you could get rid of you know, cap room in a trade. Um, I don't, I don't see the incentive in MLB for something like that, unless the nationals were going to be paying a big chunk of what was remaining on the contract. Um, so I don't think Corbin's much of a target in for a trade personally, but I would, I mean, you, of course it could happen. I don't think if there's another pitcher that could fit. Uh, I don't know if anybody would want that. any of the Oakland Athletics pitchers, but you know J.P. Sears there. Mm -hmm. He's a, he's an arm. He could eat some innings. Paul Black. My guy there. Ken Waldachuk. <laughs> we need him to stay. Yeah, he's. Didn't he have? Uh, he didn't have Tommy John. Didn't he have some type of surgery? I'm pretty yeah, sure. Waldachuk's hurt right now. Um, yeah. He is. Yeah, UCL flexor tendon surgery. Yep. So that's yeah, <laughs> that's not sound promising. Um, yeah. Doc, I know we kind of touched on most of your list here. Uh, Marty and and Elsie, want to each give us a name or two to close out the show of, of guy that you, if we haven't mentioned that you want to bring up here. Yeah, I'll do uh, Bowden Francis, uh, Toronto Blue Jays. Looks like he's gonna squeak in there to be a starting pitcher with Gosman and Alec Manoa um, being injured here. Uh, Bowden Francis over the his spring training, 14 innings pitched, 12 strikeouts, only two walks with the 3.49 XFIP, and uh, only given up three earned runs over those 14 innings. So, um, you know, he looked good last year when he was in the majors. He had a 1.73 ERA and a 0.83 whip over his 36.1 innings. He's looking good in spring, and uh, he's, he had, what was it, 
when he was um in in triple a like he had 23 strikeouts and only four walks and i think he's tapping into that strikeout ability so i think he's he's going to be for the first month or two he's going to have a spot in the rotation if not longer and if he if he does well he's going to stick because as we talked about Alec Manoa i don't i don't know I don't know where he's going. I, I I don't foresee him being in that um, in the starting rotation to begin the year, and maybe mm-hmm. not for the entire season in general. So he, Francis might be up for, for good. All right, I like that call, LC. Let's close I, this out here. I want to just throw out a few names for if you're in the middle of a draft and you're around pick three hundred and you're like, I need some depth. I'm low on. I, I've picked guys on from teams that are not big win teams maybe and i need some good win chance guys i got four guys going in the 300s john gray dane dunning ranger suarez and clark schmidt i have been getting a lot of dunning and suarez in my drafts i think these are guys with decent skills but pitching on good teams where you can try and you know win hunt with them pick your favorite gray probably has the highest end schmidt Potentially could have a high end. His whip was very high last season. I liked what Dunning game came last year. Uh, he's trying out a new fork ball, which hopefully has a bigger strikeout pitch. We'll see how much he uses that once the season starts. I just like the fact that these guys are solid pitchers with uh, good innings arms on strong teams. So take your pick. John Gray, Dane Dunning, Ranger Suarez, Clark Schmidt. Love those names. And on that note, we have concluded our starting pitcher preview. Three weeks, probably not an exaggeration. We probably covered 100 plus pitchers. Uh, I mean, we we really kind of threw a lot of names out there. And again, uh, take which ones you guys like. I feel like uh, we could even do more. Like Luis Ill, Jake Irvin. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's so many. Zach Littell. He looks good just for Tampa struck, Bay. Just struck out what five five today? Yeah, five innings, four Ks, one walk. I mean, Jake Urban on Washington Nationals. I know he was terrible last year. Twelve point two innings so far, and he has sixteen strikeouts. And, they're, and the Nationals are going to pitch him nonstop. So yep. I don't mind that. Yeah, if you don't, if if you hate yourself a little bit, why not? Why not just draft him? And Luis Ill. Am I saying that? Or that's right, right? Yeah, that that's you, correct. Yeah, yeah. with Teal. It's not. It's Ill. No, like it, it, you don't, it's Luis Heal. Heal. Okay, Luis yeah. Heal. So uh, 8.1 innings pitched this spring with a 3.33 XFIP, 14 strikeouts over those eight innings. He's looked incredible. Yeah. Uh, again, a great list of names um, as we kind of get ready to, to finish up draft season over these next couple of weeks. We just have relief pitchers left. That's the last position preview we'll be covering. And then our MySpace top eight. And then the season's going to be here. So it's going to be fun. Do you guys have your MySpace top eight picked out? Because I've slowly kind of figured out, I think, most of mine. Yeah, uh, I just go to my uh, my shares on NFBC, and it, it tells me who my top eight are. <laughs> I've done one draft, so I'll need to do a couple more before that episode. Absolutely. I, I'm not sure. I got I got a couple. I, I got three or four of them for sure locked in. But uh, Are we doing do four hitters, four pitchers, or are we going to do eight of whichever? I think eight of whichever, right? I agree with that. I might just have the Seattle Mariners full staff. <laughs> I don't know. The doc, the doc it's, strategy it's, there. It's a winning strategy, baby. <laughs> all right. Well, if you guys are enjoying the content for all the 212 of you watching right now, really appreciate the really great live audience. Back to back weeks of 200 plus people live tuning in at once, not even over the course of the whole show at once. Baseball that's, season, baby. That's amazing. Uh, so really appreciate you guys for tuning in on YouTube. If you guys listen to the podcast, that's great too. Five-star reviews and ratings and reviews are always appreciated there and help get us seen by more people. I actually just saw we were back up inside the top, I think, 80 podcasts on um, on Chartable. Uh, now that we're cranking out uh, weekly episodes again after our month-ish, month-and-a-half break. So uh, that's great to be back inside the top 100. Let's get back in the top 50. and. Yes, um if you guys have oh, I, and one more thing, we have to we're in the bracket, baby. Thank you, uh, everybody, mm-hmm. for voting for us in the uh, the fantasy baseball bracket. Um, we have passed Razball, and now we move on to 
on the corner, Nick, or that Nick Pollux. Yep. Play, we need play. you guys, all 212 of you, please log in the X and do your boys a favor. Come on. I believe please. it's next Thursday, right? We, we have our matchup on Thursdays. Uh, if next week with the Sweet 16, I think those yeah. will be spread over the early part of the week. Yeah, so we'll be next week facing off against our buddy Nick Pollock and on the Corner podcast in the Sweet 16 of the top fantasy baseball podcasts out there. So if you have an X account and you want to go and vote for your boys, go to at Baseball Pods and he will put out the voting every day next week, I believe. Just so. go to our Twitter. We'll be retweeting it. Yeah, so uh, again, Nick, obviously they're the, one of the standards in the fantasy baseball industry. They've won it, I believe, twice already. Great guys, uh, but we've never made the Elite Eight. Sweet 16s as far as we've gone, so to make the Elite Eight would be pretty, pretty awesome for us. So appreciate all you guys again. We'll be back next week for our relief pitcher preview, but until then, for Marty, for a little cheesecake for Doc, I'm D-Mendy. We're going to make like a bread truck, and we're going to haul these buns. Talk to you guys next week.